What's happening, fellas? It's your boy, Jack Slack, Fights Gone By podcast, coming at you on Thursday, the 24th of October. And we're going to be talking about some fights that are coming up at the weekend. We've got this weird UFC Singapore event, which is kind of good, but kind of not. Um, and yeah, some other stuff going on. But before we get into that, why don't we talk about all the weird news that's going on this week? And I think we'll start at the top because it doesn't get any weirder than Alexander Volkov losing his opponent for the UFC fight in uh, Moscow. I think, was it JDS, his opponent? I can't remember. At any rate, Greg Hardy is stepping in at short notice, uh, which is a bizarre one because, you know, the UFC have very carefully handpicked his bums up till now and he's not even looked great against them. Um, yeah, this should be fascinating because Volkov is very, very good, uh, except when he isn't. Like that Derek Lewis fight where he picked Derek Lewis apart for three rounds almost entirely uh, and then decided he was going to try and intercepting knee him while he was hurt in the last 15 seconds and got starched. Um, so my response to this was I can't wait for Greg Hardy to fight like shit and still somehow win. But, um, you know, it, it's interesting. You, you get to see Greg Hardy against an actual factual opponent. If you're interested in what Greg Hardy's ceiling is, I'm not. But if you are, this is a, a good one for you. Really pressure on Volkov not to fuck that one up, though. And then related to that, the Kata versus Magomed Sharipov fight, which they've delayed once already, has been moved into the main event. But it's three rounds because, you know, Magomed Sharipov, Zabit's just going to move the goalposts forever. He's terrified of Kata, um, just like he was terrified of Yair and Ortega. Uh, the guy just wants to fight schlubs like Jeremy Stevens forever. And then we get into the bantamweight division and everything's just going fucking mental there. Um, you know how we got like the most exciting division in the UFC and there's guys like Aljamain Sterling, Peter Yan, Marlon Marais, Jimmy Rivera, Rafael Asansa, you know, just got the stacked top 10 of bantamweights. Corey Sanhagen, sorry, people keep telling me he's good. Uh, but you got this stacked top, top 10 of featherweights, sorry, bantamweights, and several of them haven't had a significant loss in, in quite a while, like Corey Sandhagen um, and uh, Petty Yan. But we've decided to put Jose Aldo versus Marlon Marais, which is strange, but, I, you know, you can accept it because, well, Aldo's been doing so well at, at featherweight, aside from the fights with uh, Holloway. You know, he's still killing contenders. And, that, you know, it's so, so strange because uh, up until about a year ago, we were still talking about Aldo going to lightweight like it was inevitable. You know, I, I even mentioned him when we were talking about uh, Habib because Aldo is insanely hard to take down. But, like, overnight he decided he wanted to go to bantamweight and apparently has already, like, set all the cut up, done it all, dieted down. Um, and uh, he's putting up pictures and he's looking absolutely shredded. But, um, you know, you've got to think that's a hard cut because he used to struggle with the uh, featherweight cut back in the day. But then that seems to be the, be the direction of things. Dudes are, are able to cut more weight now for some reason or another than they could, like five, ten years ago, in spite of the IV ban and the UFC trying their hardest. God, that lad died in boxing the other day, and it took, I went about three comments deep in the thread on the Reddit boxing, which I very rarely visit, and, and already it was like, could they not do a, a, a dehydration test like 1FC does? <laughs> no, they don't do that. Number of puff pieces going around about 1FC at the moment. They, they've, uh, they've always had this guy, Brian Mazik at uh, Forbes, who just, like, they send him a press release, worded however they want it, and he prints, you know, he publishes it to Forbes. Um, but now they're on Business Insider. Uh, what's the other one? Fan Sided. That's largely shilling for, for one. Agony. They put out an article this week called um, Why Chattery's the Boss You Want to Work For or some shit like that. You know, I, I'm not going to I'm not gonna rip on people for liking one because I, I enjoy the fights at one, but... Um, I don't know. I'm in a, a fairly good position because I don't need access to people to do my job. Uh, whereas if you do, you end up getting this shilling. I mean, it's, it's a huge thing in the British media right now. Uh, there's a guy, Robert Peston and Laura, is it Kunzberg? Um, they're basically just shills for the for the uh, government. And what they do is they say, high ranking number 10 source tells me. And basically that means that Dominic Cummings has decided that he wants to put out a statement and and or you know either pretend to leak something or put out a statement and you just say oh high ranking number 10 official uh, and then they just have to do it because otherwise they lose their uh, access to court being a courtier that's what they call it sorry you got into a rant about one then uh, but i know you love the rants about one anyway elder versus marias um yeah i like it because like marias is coming off the loss to Cejudo, even though he's the 
the thing is, like, well, I say I like it. Let's let's do the other one first. The other one they announced was uh, Petty Ann, you know, who's streaking on the cusp of a title shot, really. And they decided to slot Uriah Faber in against him. Now, if you remember when Uriah Faber fought Ricky Simon, Simone, rather, um, I was like, this is probably the the best ranking guy I could see Faber having a good chance against because he is so square. He comes in, he eats right hands constantly. And, you know, the overhand right is basically all that Faber does. Uh, that's what happened in actual, you know, reality. And now they've slotted him back into, like, titan- title contention. They're putting him in with Petty Yan. I mean, Petty Yan shouldn't lose this one, but um, just a, a weird, weird fight. And if you pair the two together, it's even weirder because... Henry Cejudo is not going to defend one of his titles, and I would guess it's the bantamweight title because he looked so small and he had so much trouble in that um, Mariah's fight. So you should be doing either an interim title fight or an actual title fight with a vacant title between, say, Marias and Yan, or Marias and Sterling, or Sterling and Yan, you know, the ones that make sense. I know it's only going to be like, you know, the next... Th- uh, two to four months that these are going to be playing out over but it's just that division's now on hold for no reason and it was already sort of on hold because Cejudo's MIA <laughs> just get a text from the wife calling me a hero because I said just written an article and now I have to uh, recharge and try and be funny for 40 minutes um so yeah I mean that's our news it's a weird platter I mean the other one was that Conor McGregor's announced his uh, return date but it was the Mac Life tweeting it so I was like fuck that for a start fuck you and the horse that you rode in on when someone opened the gates uh, to the press conference and let you in through the cargo bay or whatever it was um, but also like I'm not going to click a thing that says so and so announces his return date give me a fucking date in a fight I shouldn't have to click it also, you know, Connor, like Francis Ngannou, is just being like, I will fight in two weeks' time, <laughs> constantly, because he wants the attention. Actually, there was an amazing one this week. Um, Paige Van Zandt, our girl. Uh, she's made a face turn. She's made a face turn. No, uh, Macy Barber's calling Paige Van Zandt out desperately because, uh, you know, it's easy to call Paige Van Zandt out because you just go, oh, she's a bimbo. She's not even that good at fighting. Uh, but, you know, the reason you're calling her out is because she's got name value. Like, name value compared to ability with Paige Van Zandt, is, is about the best ratio you're ever going to get. You ain't calling out someone like Tatiana Suarez, who no one knows, but is also a fucking monster. Um, so Macy Barber kept calling her out and be like, oh, she's a fake fighter, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Paige Van Zandt put out a, a thing that she tagged every member of the UFC uh, strawweight and flyweight roster and, and said, I will fight any of these people. I refuse to fight Macy Barber because <laughs> she's rude. Um, which, you know... I think we're all on the same page that Macy Barber would probably win that fight. But it's just, that's a hilarious level of pettiness. It's something I completely agree with. And it's something I respect. Especially if Paige knows she'd lose, she'd lose that fight. Because, you know, why the fuck, why are you calling this woman out? She's barely fighting for the last two years. Anyway, let's talk about some of these fights going on this weekend. We got two Bellators. We got a one event and we've got a UFC event. And there's also a Cage Warriors. You know, I like to keep up with the Cage Warriors. I probably won't cover them. Like, you know, it's not a card that's full of names that you need to know. But I do like them. Um, so I, I try to give them a little bit of time. But we'll talk about the Bellators and the UFC mainly. Um, the one event is is all right. Um, it's got uh, Sebastian Cadastam in the main event, who basically, I, I, is that the, I think that's their welterweight division. He took over once uh, Askren went. But he was like two and two when he fought Askren. Uh, or two and two in his last four, at least. Uh, and Askren just mauled him. Because there was no point in him being in there. But he did knock out Sapo with a jumping knee cut pass that like hit him in the face while he was doing the pass. It was gorgeous. Um, so he's fine. And then uh, Nicky Hoskins fighting, who's always fun. Um, and John Lineker's making his promotional debut against Muin Gefurov, who is the number four bantamweight in Central Asia, according to Tapology. That'd be, that'd be dope if John Lineker lost that. Um, you know, it's always good to, to uh, it's, it's always good for the people who are like, I told you the UFC doesn't have the best fighters. Gotta keep them alive because they're so wrong the majority of the time. So the Bellator ones, you know, it's hit and miss like every Bellator, but Bellator on Friday is literally no one's talking about this. Even Teep to the Junk on his own subreddit called Bellator Nation, which you should check out because it's what happens when an AI just goes haywire. Uh, he's just posting millions of things with no comments and no upvotes and nothing going on. Yeah, even he's not talking about it. No one is talking about this fight. Frank Mir versus Roy Nelson 3, sorry, 2, uh, they rebooked it. And the only exciting thing about it is that the poster, uh, if you look at it long enough, it looks like Roy Nelson's beard is growing 
into Frank Mears. It's going to absorb him or crawl all over him like the um, the symbiote in... Uh, well, I was going to say Spider-Man, but I suppose the film Venom. But if you can remember the first Mears and Nelson fight, um, write in, please, because I don't. <laughs> Literally, the only thing I remember from that fight is a sweet Harai Goshi um, throw off the fence by Mir. Uh, and Mir has always had bad wrestling. It's been a major letdown for him throughout his career. But he still ragdolled uh, Roy Nelson from the clinch, which was pretty dope. Uh, and I think there was another one where Roy's just shitty striking let him down, you know. Uh, and how long has it been since Roy actually picked up a knockout? Because he worked it out. Like, he just had to herd people to the fence and then stand a little bit to their left, to, to his left. So that they circle out towards his right hand and then he just fling it straight at them. You know, um, straight arm, like, looping blow. And he knocked out loads of guys with that back-to-back. When was that? Well, not not, not back-to-back, but he was knocking out, like, uh, Struve, Krokop, Dave Herman, Matt Mitrio, and Czech Congo, uh, Antonio Rodrigo, Nogue- uh, Rodrigo Nogueira, all the same way. Um, loads of losses in that time, too. But then just... When was the last... It literally... Oh, no, he knocked out Bigfoot Silver because Bigfoot Silver is a ghost. Um, but it's been since 2016. God, I didn't know he picked up a, a knockout win in 2016. That feels like way more recent than I remember. But 2016 and then back to 2014. And he's fought like a dozen times since then. And his, basically, he doesn't really have it anymore. And you can tell that because he lost a decision to Krokop in his last fight. And that was Krokop just before he had a stroke and uh, retired from MMA for good. Because he was, he was going on way too long. And Sergei Heratanov stopped him too. But it, like, just... The whole thing with Roy is like, turns up and he goes, we all go, oh, what if he uses his grappling this time? And I think he did against Mitrione and it still wasn't great. Um, you know, he's got a black belt in jiu-jitsu, but mainly what he used to do is just lay on people. Um, and Mir, like his whole thing was grabbing a submission, wrenching it and then gassing out if he didn't tear their arm off. This one will be bad. But because it's Bellator and they're both so washed, someone will get stopped and people will go, that was an awesome knockout. You were wrong, Jack. <laughs> um, that's Scott Coker matchmaking in a nutshell. More interesting stuff going on that. Um, we've got Phil Davis versus Carl Albrechtson. If you remember Albrechtson, he had a really fun fight with Jiri um, back in Rising, where they both got covered in blood. And he lost that in the, in the like dying seconds of round one. But since then, he's on a three-fight winning streak. Um, hasn't fought in Bellator before, so this is Bellator de- debut. Looks a little bit here like they're setting up Phil Davis for a win. Um, Phil Davis, fucking hell, I watched... Davis versus Bader 2 again the other day. Ask me why. I watched it because Ben Askren said that Davis hit a slick um, turnover. In it. Uh, he called it the sweet, uh, which is where you like use a... Uh, like if you were going for a Kimura from the turtle, but you reach around and grab their leg on the same side instead, and then you post on your head and jump over the top of them. Um, and uh, that fight and Bellator's player was so shit that I actually didn't find that. I just watched 25 minutes, well, more, because I went back, of just dreadful mma dreadful kickboxing mainly but um i was surprised at the end when uh when bader won that one but never mind um so phil davis what's he done lately he beat liam mcgeary uh, jessica mcgeary liam mcgeary by jaw in- injury uh, and lost to vadim nemkov before that we're all excited for vadim nemkov we're not excited for phil davis um you know lots of kicking lots of not getting things done uh he was on that big john breakdown thing and, you know, I don't like to shit on other, quote, analysts because I am uh, allegedly, people allege me of being, people accuse me of being an analyst. Uh, but Big John Breakdown is the funniest shit. They they haven't quite worked out the the um, layout for it, the, the way that they're going to do it. So they did one and it was really boring. And then they did one with Matt Mitrione and they started with Big John, flash of light, Out of the light comes Big John's face looking down and he looks up into the camera like a badass. And then they go, bow, no, 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 no. And he goes, Matt, bow, no, 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 no. You're a southpaw. Bow, no, 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 no. But you're right handed. Bow, no, 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 no. Bow, bow, bow. And then they show loads of knockouts or like the one knockout that Mitrione has in um, Bellator. (laughs) But it's just terrible. And then they finally toned it down a bit for this most recent one. Go watch the Mitrione Big John breakdown. It's the best thing you'll ever watch. Um... In the Big John Breakdown with Phil Davis, they do actually talk about, you know, there's interesting tidbits in it. But Big John goes, and you like wearing pink shorts? And Phil Davis goes, yes, a lot of women in my family have struggled with cancer and I wear them to show solidarity with, uh, you know, people, women who are struggling with cancer. And you can see 
or you can feel even in the edited version everyone in the studio going can he do that because susan g komen exists to sue people for using pink in relation to breast cancer like they don't they barely do anything for actual charity they mainly exist to sue other charities um allegedly someone else said that not me but what else is going on beck rawlins the uh bare knuckle hall of famer the greatest bare knuckle fighter of this generation uh, is back to fight some scrub um jake hager is back to fight some scrub Various other people are fighting scrubs because it's Bellator. And then the only interesting thing is that Ed Ruth's back to fight Jason Jackson. And I enjoy Ed Ruth, e- even if he did sort of screw the pooch against um, Naaman Gracie. Uh, he is uh, very promising because he's one of the best wrestlers of the recent few years, isn't he? He's, he's got an amazing, uh, or I was reading some of his stats and they were amazing. Um, and uh, he's actually got some good DVDs out on wrestling, uh, or certainly his approach to wrestling. He's also pretty black explosive. He knocks dudes out, which I like. But then the other Bellator card is the one that actually matters, and that's McDonald versus Lima 2. And I think you should be excited for that, because if you don't, you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's up. Um, their first fight was really good. I mean, basically, Rory was supposed to come in and just be the welterweight king. And, you know, he smashed uh, Paul Daly, which, you know, if you know what Paul Daly does, his weakness has always been on, on the ground. Rory McDonald has always been good at getting to takedown and just a punishing top player but um mcdonald versus lima i mean uh lima did well underneath him because lima has a, a very good guard like he's really good with his butterfly hooks uh, and he's just also quite good at staying out of trouble like you know even if you pass his guard he'll just be you know t- turning in to come up on a single or pushing you back into his guard very tricky to you know he's not going to be like paul daly just s- stuck under your chest pressure while you elbow him in the head but Lima, you know, he's famous for the low kicks. And it, I think it was round three or four, he finally starts throwing them because he was sort of lacking the confidence to do it. And he just, something just bulges out of Rory's leg from the moment that he starts kicking the leg. And it looked like he could have got the finish. But Rory, yeah, I mean, Rory gutted through it well and uh, and got back into some grappling exchanges and stuff. But basically, since that first fight, people have been saying, what if Lima had got to that sooner? Because it did look like a, a real... Um, a confidence issue because you're facing this incredible uh, top player and, and takedown artist and you're going well if I kick him I am letting him have my leg um, but if he just got to it sooner you know maybe he could have finished the fight uh, so I mean that's the intrigue here we're excited for that Lima obviously coming through the tournament he uh, fought Koreshkov in the first round and uh, finished that one by rear naked choke after knocking him out in their previous fight so he's now two and three uh, two and one on the trilogy it's pretty much done and then he met Michael Page in the second round, and uh, it actually wasn't that effective on, in the first round when he was on top. Didn't really do anything, and then caught him with that leg kick. And the fluke uppercut that upsets so many people when you say, what are the chances of that landing? Uh, the Marge Simpson straight arm uppercut with wind up, and uh, knocked out Michael Page, and then sent Michael Page back to fighting four fight veterans, <laughs> uh, who are also maths teachers in their in their main life. Um just terrible what they do with Michael Page. Terrible that people believe in it. But that was Lima's run. Rory McDonald's run was a little bit less uh, um, convincing, if, if we're honest. Uh, he fought John Fitch in the first round, and basically he got fitched. You know, uh, you know, the guy just sort of kept driving into him and putting him to the fence and, and that, putting him on his butt on the fence. Rory kept looking for the the Kimura and the Kimura trap sort of stuff. But it, if you can't roll over and do that, or roll them over and do it. Um, you're just sort of stuck against the fence, which is what a lot of that fight was. And then he fought Naaman Gracie in the uh, semifinals. I can't remember a lot of that fight. I remember Naaman doing some cool stuff, but Rory getting the uh, decision. Um, and I don't remember complaining too much about the decision. But I'm just saying that Rory hasn't looked anywhere near unstoppable in this tournament. So a confident Lima coming off two uh, stoppages and a shaky sort of Rory, uh, especially when like after the Fitch one, he was going... I don't know if I can hurt people anymore uh, because of God. Uh, you know, you go, oh, that's not great. But yeah, we, we could be in a position where title changes hands. I would love to see Douglas Lima finally get the fucking respect he deserves. But the uh, the thing that does bug me about Lima is that, firstly, he's one of those fighters who doesn't always push his advantages very well. Uh, he's a little bit inactive a lot of the time. Um, and secondly, you know, this plays into that. He doesn't really throw a lot of combinations. He's got a wicked counter left hook, good booming overhand right terrific right low kick but he doesn't set the low kicks up and he doesn't really like hide any of his other techniques he's got a good counter left hook so he'll time you well but um and and a a stiff jab too i think he might be left-handed but um 
that's just a guess from from how he hits but you know it's it's more like one at a time and you get the feeling like if you just threw some up and down combinations you know don't i'm not asking for like gokan saki in his prime in kickboxing i'm just asking for like two or three punches and a kick maybe or two you know two or three strikes total um so yeah that'll be terrific hopefully you know it always it always goes off kind of quietly uh the bellator even the big fights in bellator unless it's like fedor or someone you don't really hear about it that much but i don't think i've been let down by a douglas lima fight he always comes in with some kind of adjustment uh like the koreshkov one koreshkov hit him with a load of high crotch takedowns in the first fight uh, and lima had like clearly wasn't expecting it because <laughs> koreshkov was supposed to be the kickboxer um but then second fight lima Every time Koreshkov goes for his leg, his leg he, he retracts the leg straight behind him and, and switches stance uh, and tries to hit him on the counter as, as he's reaching. Or he goes to the butt drag and pulls himself around to the back by Koreshkov's hole. Uh, <laughs> but, and then uh, the Daly fight, he came in with this sharp left hook, just waiting for Daly's left hook, which is pretty ballsy. You know, you're like, oh, this guy's famous for the one punch he throws. Uh, I'm going to try and beat him to the punch on that specific punch. Hooking with a hooker, literally, and uh, did it amazingly. But what else we got on the card? Paul Daly's on the card against Sadawad. You know, neither guy going for a title shot too soon, but both fun bangers. Though Sadawad, the last time I saw him, he was getting embarrassingly armbarred by Goti Yamauchi. Um, that was that was bad. He just sort of like sat on his guard going, yeah, he can't armbar me. Oh, he's armbarred me from here. Um, he's on a three-fight losing streak, so, you know, ooh. Whereas Paul Daly, still trying to make up to the fans for that MVP fight. And then in the um, further down the card, you've got Robin Van Roosmalen making his Bellator debut. And if you're a Patreon boy, I just wrote a long article about this, an audio article, because what I'm doing now is I um, record audio of the article. So if you don't want to read it, if you just want to look at the pictures and listen to me read it to you, I'll do that. You know, that that's there for you. Um, and then, you know, that's not as someone who absorbs a lot of audio audiobooks, I do so much. Uh, I, anytime I do any road work or any treadmill work or anything like that, I have an audible book, an audio. I have an audio book on. Um, it is a fantastic way to absorb stuff and multitask at the same time. But I wrote this article about Robin Van Marlin and the, the myth of six months of straw, straw training. Won't all, spoil the article, but I've always said Robin Van Marlin's style seems horribly, or at least kickboxing style, seemed horribly set up to deal with MMA. And what I've seen of him so far in MMA is that sort of uh, 2000s kickboxer coming to MMA style where I'm going to fight with my upper body forward and my hips back and i'm gonna you know halfway to the sprawl and anytime you come in i'm just gonna sprawl and luckily he's fought two absolute scrubs who just dived on takedowns wouldn't even try and punch him uh i think as soon as he meets someone who can use the fence and isn't terrified of him on the feet he's gonna have a lot of trouble and nick newell's there uh, and we love nick newell so that's great and then the ufc card the singapore card which is kind of weird uh there's not an awful lot on this i mean it's all good and this is how i describe the main event too like it's good and I personally am going to sit down and watch it, and, and I'm a little bit excited for it, but I can't really sell it to you in a way that will excite you. I'm not sure how to do that. Because especially with Damien Meyer versus Ben Askren, I know there's a good chance of it being just a stinker. Um, I think the interesting thing there is that Damien Meyer's had a lot of trouble with guys who can stop him taking them down, uh, even with that poor half guard and come up on the Lucas Lech style single. But he's fought guys who are good enough to stay off him in strike. Ben Askren generally has always been willing to go to the ground with you, even if you're like a BJJ black belt. But Remember that Ben Askren is coming off that knockout loss to Jorge Masvidal, and he said, like, I might have to learn how to strike. This would be probably the one where he could test his striking. So be very cautious about that. Um, Maya's striking has always actually been pretty underrated because, you know, he was getting better at it. And then he got knocked out by uh, Nate Marquardt because he was full falling in love with his kickboxing. And then he sort of gave it up later and was like, I'm not doing it anymore. But he's always had a good left straight and he, he's hurt Mark Munoz with it. Uh, he hurt Gunnar Nelson with it, um, you know, even in that super grappling heavy performance. But I've always liked it when he just sprinkles it in there. He can actually pop guys pretty hard. Whereas Ben Askren has like granny hands and um, has shown very, you know, absolutely nothing. He won't even throw a punch before he shoots. In your co-main, I mean, I love me some Stevie Ray and Michael Johnson, but the co-main should tell you that we're not peak level card here. Uh, these guys are good for, uh, you know, uh, pay-per-view cards. You put them lower down. But uh, Michael Johnson, obviously, on a weird streak because he was on an amazing... You know, he's like the last person to beat Tony Ferguson. He starched Dustin Poirier. 
Uh, it's just uh, got an amazing record, but also a shit record. You know, you, just, you never know what you're getting with Michael Johnson. And I think a lot of that is because he left a lot in Jim Wars. If you watch any of him, like he's mainly famous now for Instagram footage going up of him and another guy going too hard. Whether it's Kamaru Usman, Nikki Holskin, Robin Van Riesmalen, you just and you're going, okay, well that's three. I I can assume that you're probably doing this quite a lot and uh, giving up some brain cells in the practice room. But, you know, he, he had that life and death one with Andre Feely, and uh, he beat Artem Lobov in his last one, sorry, his uh, last one before that Emmett fight, but then the Emmett fight, to be fair, the Emmett fight was also competitive, but then he just ate an overhand and, and went down, because Emmett's thing is, like, move around lots and then just jab overhand from either stance. <laughs> it's TJ Dillashaw without any of the variety. Stevie Ray, meanwhile, one of the boys from higher level, most recently came back against Leonardo, Dos, uh, sorry, Leonardo Santos, who was coming back from a layoff, uh, and got knocked out. But, uh, you know, he does enough to stay in the UFC. He's a good fighter. He beat Joe Lozon, Ross Pearson, most recently Jessica Ayari, but um, sort of struggling in the in the middle there. I think a lot of his problem has been that he's a good striker, but he doesn't doesn't seem to... Ha- I don't want to say he doesn't have any power, but he doesn't seem to land those sort of clean connections that either win you around dominantly or work you towards a finish. Johnson has been a big hitter in the past, but he seemed to have lost a little bit of that. Uh, when he went down to uh, featherweight, but we're back up at lightweight now. Really, John, uh, what I always say about Johnson is that I am, am impressed how much he's gotten out of a very limited striking game. You know, it's, it shows that like movement and timing and things can be more important than variety. Um, he, he mainly like low kicks, uh, lateral movement, and straight punches, and he's done amazing with. It. He beat Tony Ferguson with those. Uh, beat uh, Dustin Poirier with them. You know, he's a very beat. Edson Barbosa. God, every time I think about Michael Johnson, I remember another big name he's beaten. But does it with a very limited skill set, which is, uh, sorry, uh, tool set, which is quite cool. Then you've got Benil Dariush versus Frank Camacho. That's great. Uh, Dariush really should be working back into contention now because he dropped out when he lost to uh, Alexander Hernandez. You know, he was a top 10 fighter and he took a uh, short notice opponent and it turned out that that guy was a beast. Um, but he's, he's won two back to back. He armbarred Drew Dober, who's good. Uh, had a cancelled bet with uh, Draco Close and now he's in against Camacho. Camacho is Mr. Fight of the Night or at least reliable contender for Fight of the Night. Uh, I hope the UFC are paying him good money because he's always entertaining. But he's on a, a one and uh, one and two streak. You know, he lost to Dober in a, a fantastic fight if you haven't seen that one. Lost to Jeff Neal, got knocked out and then beat Nick Hine by punch uh, by knockout. Um, so I would expect Benil Darius to get back in into, um, you know, uh, his winning ways. But uh, Camacho is tricky and durable and well-conditioned, which we like all of those things. Really, the only other stuff I care about on this card is Muslim Salikov, fantastic Sander guy, uh, Sanshao guy, whatever. Um, Cyril Garn is back against Dontail uh, Myers, who I know nothing about. Uh, you, like I said, I wrote a big piece on Cyril Garn. If you're a Patreon boy, you can go check that out from back in uh, uh, a couple of months ago, probably was, or before his UFC debut at least. And uh, Rafael Pessoa, who uh, Cyril Garn beat for his like shot at the UFC, uh, he's now back. He's he's opening the night against Jeff Hughes, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you got Alexander Alexander Albu, who uh, if you don't know, a girl got an ass like I've never seen, uh, which is okay because like that's all she ever posts on any of her social media. She's fighting, I believe it's the UFC's first Tie Fighter. I was going to try and make the sound of the Tie Fighter from Star Wars then, but I won't. But uh, Loma uh, Luke Bunmi, uh, neither, I mean, both these lasses are three and one. Neither of them is particularly spectacular. Um, again, the only spectacular thing is Alexandra Albu's ass. But yeah, fun enough. And then Sergei Pavlovich, who actually didn't look like trash in his last fight. I thought he looked pretty good, he used his length well. Uh, but then he, again, he wasn't fighting over him. He's fighting Maurice Green this time round. And Green's on a three fight winning streak because he just knocked out um, Junior Albini, which was a surprise. Anyway, like I said, not the best cards in the world, but plenty going on, which is good fun. We've got quantity over quality here. Um, and that Maya versus uh, Askren fight should be good. I, I, I've been watching that role between... Well, I've been watching a couple of roles between Marcelo Garcia and Damien Maya, and then Marcelo Garcia and Ben Askren this week. And they're both great because, you know, Marcelo Garcia just murders both of them. I mean, there's footage of... Just to stamp home how good Marcelo Garcia is. Marcelo Garcia... There's footage of him rolling with the now two-time ADCC champion JT Torres, who I think that was Marcelo's division he won uh, both times. Um, But uh, there's footage of him rolling with him like uh, last year or the year before, and he's just hanging with the ADCC champ or two-time ADCC champ. And he's been retired for five, six years now. 
guy's a monster, but he just mauled Askren. And, you know, he used to compete against Damian Meyer, and they had some good matches. But Meyer's been to, to MMA, and while Meyer's grappling in MMA is god tier, just watching him roll with uh, Marcelo Garcia just hammers home how competing for grappling and working that every day, twice a day is so different to having to divide your time between other skills. You know, even even though we consider Maya almost a one-dimensional grappler at this point, he's still putting time into wrestling, and he's still putting time into sparring with strikes, you know, um, whereas Marcelo is just training top-level grapplers and, and rolling with them every day. Let's do a couple of questions before we get out of here for today. Hi, Jack. Big fan of the podcast, your articles, and of course, the Filthy Casuals Guides. I was recently reading Stephen Edwards' Daily Bread mailbag on Boxing Scene. I don't know if you read the mailbag, but Stephen Edwards is a great trainer and writer and provides a lot of insight into boxing. In the mailbag recently, there was a question about top five guard defenses in boxing. Edwards was saying that flashier upper body movement and footwork defenses get more recognition but the guard-based defences were still extremely valuable in boxing. Do you think a defence based on blocking and a solid guard is more valuable in, M- in MMA than boxing due to head kicks and knees? And who would you rate as having a top 10 guard-slash-blocking defences in MMA? Sorry for the long question and thanks for all your work. Cheers from Jake from Australia. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm probably going to disagree with Stephen Edwards here because, like, I mean, boxing, if you were just training boxing, and to be honest, I get drawn into this if I train, you know, when I train um, boxing or, you know, hands only sparring with uh, MMA fighters and things like that. Um, you know, you get drawn into doing the shoulder roll and things like that because it works. It works very well in a boxing context. Uh, and we always talk about like Floyd and the and the shoulder roll or the stone wall or the Philly shell, whatever you want to call it. Because in boxing, you know, the backside of the body is generally an illegal target. The kidney is illegal. You you can try, like Canelo Alvarez was digging him in against Floyd Mayweather, which is a good thing to do. But the backside of the body is illegal. So if you turn side on, that's one half of what's available. Their, their right hand is basically only offered your head. And if you bring your shoulder up and you just roll away each time, you've taken away that target, or you rather you draw that strikes to that and then deflect them. Um, so, you know, you can really cut down the number of things the opponent is actually going to be able to to throw at. Whereas, even without the takedowns and stuff, if you put in kicks, it gets way harder. If you allow if you allow dudes to punch legs in boxing, you'd, you'd be, you know, that uh, lead leg out style side on stance would be way harder to get away with because dudes would just be punching you in the thigh all the time. Um, it's just having a lack of legal targets that makes it very tricky in boxing now that's not to say that shoulder rolls and things don't work in mma i'm always saying guys need to get better at getting down behind their shoulders and elbows and things um, rather than putting their gloves up and that's the big change in in mma sorry boxing kickboxing and then mma the smaller gloves the effect on punching power is um you know it's always a surprise when people find out that generally people can hit harder with gloves on because you've got the weight of it but you uh you know defensively the big gloves definitely make a difference if you can hide behind them. You cannot hide nearly as effectively behind four-ounce gloves because you just don't have as much padded area. And again, that Robin Van Roosmalen article that I've just published on Fight Primer, um, just talking about this, like Robin Van Roosmalen was glory lightweight and featherweight champion, one of their most successful fighters ever, one of the most successful Dutch kickboxers ever, and he just basically sought tit-for-tat exchanges. He'd take punches on his gloves, come back with punches, and then a low kick on the end. And it, it really, like, it won judges over. But doing that in MMA is almost impossible. And you can see him in his first two MMA fights. He has no intention of doing that. He's not going to stand there and take blows. Now, guys like Justin Gaethje, he used to do surprisingly well with a double forearms guard. I think there is a place for it. Um, I trained with one of... Uh... Ages ago, I trained with one of Shogun's coaches. Um, and he, he was talking about how they worked uh, extensively on like a double forearms guard for that um which fight was it might have been i think liddell fight he uses it but i can't remember what what fight they were talking about when they said they were starting to train it um but in the liddell fight you can certainly see him use it that sequence where he like kicks him in the body weaves some punches has his guard up really high uh with his uh, with his forearms like pinched together um and that was something apparently they were working on for uh fuck i can't even remember which opponent it was now but you can see it against chuck but yeah, it has its place. I'm always like, you know, there's many different strokes for different folks and there's a lot of different ways to fight. But if I were teaching someone and wanted to impart on them the importance of staying safe, I would say, ideally, you don't want to block any punches. Ideally, your feet should be taking care of everything because that doesn't take nearly as much effort. You walk around all day, moving your feet, generally the best defense, keeping good distance, stuff like that. 
if you find yourself in range, you should be able to block punches. You should be able to cover up. And the whole thing is like, you can't cover up super effectively. Maybe you have to do like the crazy monkey stuff, bring your elbow all the way up, expose your body a bit. But if you treat it as I shouldn't be in that close anyway, you don't have to worry about like no guard being perfect. You just have to say, okay, well, I'm making the best of a bad situation and I'm either moving to the clinch or I'm moving out of range again. And certainly it's always a good idea to have your forearms to your sides ready in case a kick comes in because you, the last thing you want to get surprised by is a body kick uh, because some of them are surprisingly long. Guys will surprise you with how far out they can kick from and how um, small a telegraph they can do if they're very good kickers. But yeah, but, I mean, blocking will always be important. I think you've always got to learn how to do it. Uh, but I also think you've got to eschew from your mind any idea that you're going to be like winky right. You know, you just put your gloves on your head and his elbows stretched like down to his thighs. <laughs> he had these ridiculous long arms. But winky right was like, yep, I'm untouchable now. And Floyd Mayweather, when he turns side on, it's like, yeah, I'm untouchable now. Or anyone using a, a side on style uh, shoulder rolling stonewall guard. But yeah, do not think of that when you're thinking about guarding for MMA. Cheers, Jake. Hi, Jack. Nick here. Is there much benefit to autistically studying fighters from more than a few years ago or fighters from decades past? I would guess old school boxing, kickboxing and grappling are more relevant than old school MMA. But can you roughly lay out how old is obsolete for the major combat sports? Thanks a ton. Uh, good question, Nick. Really good question, actually. Uh, and I think this is something interesting because like if I, you know, I love st studying Jack Johnson. You know, I did a big history episode on Jack Johnson and I've written a lot on Jack Johnson in the past. A lot of what Jack Johnson did was interesting, but completely illegal in boxing now. Uh, you know, the, the bicep ties and things like that. But learning about how, you know, watching him and learning about how to get to clinches and use bicep ties uh, against people who are trying to punch you. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and then I saw guys like Raphael Agaev doing it in uh, point karate, too. But I think, like, you know, there's a lot of MMA, certainly, like, if you go back a few few years, things are much worse. Um, but I don't know if that means obsolete. Like, I see a lot of st even watching just old pride fights, I see a lot of interesting stuff that um, still would probably work. Like, the other day, well, I was watching Sakuraba versus Henzo. The back take attempt that Henzo does uh, to initiate that final sequence with the Kimura, where he's on the back body lock, um, really quite slick it's a deep de la Hiva hook he just kicks it straight and then comes up behind sakuraba uh, and he, and uh, i was just watching keenan cornelius talk about that the other day he was like yeah i'm bringing this back to nogi uh, you know a uh, quick little move but still you know you don't see it as much in nogi because guys love in the gi to use the belt and stuff and each segment of the transition is wonderfully clean and controlled um whereas in, in nogi guys don't like it as much uh, but henzo did it then and then uh Keenan, 15, 20 years later, was like, oh, I'm bringing this back. This is a new thing for me. And I think the other thing about MMA is that guys have... You have not seen anywhere near everything from all the combat sports attempted in MMA. Uh, I was talking about this in my most recent article on the Fight Primer. Like, you know, imagine someone like John Smith shooting low singles in MMA or David Taylor coming out and trying to ankle pick people. You know, you, you can't imagine that working. But Sakuraba had incredible success with the low single, and you don't see the low single anymore. But he did have incredible success with it. Um, he took a, a ton of damage, and some of that was probably related to the low single, but the low single is still a legit takedown. Uh, you just don't see it an awful lot. Habib uses them sometimes to come up on, like, you know, to, to dive miles across the ring and then come up on a leg. But it's almost unused, almost unheard of in MMA. And some, you know, Sakuraba was years ago using it masterfully. I have zero doubt that a, a top-level wrestler, if they got comfortable striking and were coming to MMA, I have zero doubt that they could use some of the stuff that Sakuraba did. Like the thing where he kicked the leg until they picked the leg up and when you fake the kick so that they picked the leg up to check and shoot a, single on, a low single on the other leg. Um, that shit was awesome. And no one does it. Similarly with the BJJ, I was watching a Haleta, uh, an old Haleta match, it was, it was. This is how old it was. He was against Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira in the Mundials. I think it was the final uh, of some black belt di division. But uh, it's like in a sports center somewhere and a rat runs across the mat and between the ref's legs while they're rolling. <laughs> um, but Haleta uh, is someone I was looking into because Ryan Hall was talking about him. You know, I'm a big fan of Ryan Hall's uh, instructionals and I was watching his uh, inverted stuff because I basically watch them all in order and then go, oh, I've forgotten the first one and I go back. 
Uh, Ryan Hall was saying that he was inspired heavily by uh, Hulletta and there isn't a lot of footage of him, but what there is is good. And I went back and watched it. And because like there weren't a ton of slick submissions on it, I hadn't seen them in like highlights or anything. But I did see him against Antonio Rodrigo Nogueira, sorry, Rodrigo Nogueira, using inversions in a way that I didn't think people did back then. Um, and, and in a way that I was like, you could still do that today. So I would say, bear in mind that everything's generally gotten better <laughs> like in, in these sports. But I don't know if things, you know, an awful lot is obsolete in that you can do whatever you can do if you can get away with it against the opponent you're facing at this moment. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, that goes kind of against what Ryan Hall's always saying about, like, I don't want to be able to do it to blue belts. I wanted to be able to do it to world champions. But a fight is a binary thing. You are either the faster man or the slower man. You're the stronger man or the weaker man. You're the harder hitter or the softer hitter. And um, whatever you do, if it's good enough to beat that one guy, it's good enough. So... You know, the only thing stopping people from doing things is trying them. Um, I would say, if you see someone doing something cool in the past, ask why it wouldn't work, try it, and uh, if it does work... I mean, eventually, I probably your coach will come over and go, don't do that, this is what will happen. But I, I have trained with guys who've been like, don't, um, don't use high crotches for MMA, uh, guillotine, very dangerous... And then, you know, Abdulmap, Abdulmanap uh, Nurmagomedov comes out and he's like, we never, ever shoot anything except uh, head outside singles because, <laughs> you know, we don't care about being guillotined. We can defend those. We care about being kneed in the head. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think meta is always changing. Uh, and especially with things like wrestling where guys come up and they're really good at, you know, wrestling and judo and things like that are great because you develop uh, a, a favorite technique a tokui waza something you know all the ins and outs to uh, and then dudes come to mma and they're like don't try that we do double legs and we push people to the fence and you're like well that's just a different form of wrestling you're making him do what if you tried to make his form of wrestling work in mma that'd be interesting um, and and to be fair ben Askren, who's fighting this weekend has done that in spite of all our you know when he was coming up we were all like well what happens when he meets a really good bjj black belt and then he meets lima and he's like nah no problem mate um so yeah i don't know if there is a, a good way to tell what's obsolete if the rules haven't outlawed it there's probably a way you can use it you just might have to use some uh smarts to set it up cheers nick right i reckon that'll do us for this week i will be back on monday to chat about the fights that were um the ufc singapore dojo storming going into one's home territory uh and the bellator cards if you want to read that robin van roosmalen audio article read it or listen to it uh, or support the podcast so i can do this twice a week sign up to the patreon if you want to send an email to the podcast fights gone by podcast at gmail.com and if you want to see what i'm writing at any time fightprimer.com i'm your boy jack slack singaporean venture capitalists bless <laughs>